אהבה, נגיל אהבה, נגיל אהבה, נגיל אהבה נשמחה, אהבה, נגיל אהבה, נגיל אהבה, נגיל אהבה נשמחה. Shulamis was a writer, poet, author about whom I'm doing a book right now in Montreal and so I've been commuting back and forth. And Ezra was a Talmudic scholar. No, I was not raised in a religious household. I was raised in an ethnic cultural household. Um, I did have a great deal of uh, exposure to uh, Orthodox Judaism because I went to an Orthodox Hebrew-speaking camp for 12 years, Camp Massad in the Laurentian Mountains near Montreal. And um, my, the school that I went to was an ethnic culture Jewish school, Jewish Peret Shula, which was steeped in Judaism, but from an ethnic point of view, not from a religious point of view. And the school was uh, composed in such a way that half a day was English and French, and half a day was Jewish and Hebrew. But even at the time, I was already worrying about certain things that I was learning. And when I was eight in my Chumash class, that is in the Torah class, and because the Torah teacher was, was Orthodox, um, we only spoke Yiddish in this class because you can't speak the second language when you study it. And I noticed that uh, the pronouns for God in the Torah and Hebrew were both male and female. And so I asked my teacher, how is this possible? I posed this question to you, how is it possible that the names of God are male and female, single and plural, and that we only talk about he? Well, he raced down the aisle, he picked me up by the hair and threw me out, and I was never allowed back. So that was the beginning of a feminist perspective, of course I didn't know the word then, but I knew that there was a real inequality and that there were, being, there were secrets that were being withheld, that the orthodoxy kept, uh, kept us out. Only much later, a few years ago, I did a painting called Koli Shah. Uh, is it here? Yeah. No, it's not here. It's on the show. Koli Shah means voice of a woman, and in Judaism it means that the voice of a woman should never be heard because if a voice of a woman is heard, men can be distracted from their studies and begin to think about all kinds of terrible things. <laughs> so I think in that instance, my Orthodox teacher was very distracted and uh, his, his armor was pierced in a way that he didn't want to deal with it. Uh, it was an accident. I was going to be a, a writer and a psychologist. And um, I did three BAs, and then I got a job as the West Coast Stringer for Art News magazine, Art magazine. So I began writing art reviews, and then I felt that I was a hypocrite, that I was writing art reviews about something I wasn't doing. So I figured, well, I'll take an art class. So I took first painting class in Berkeley, where I was graduating, and it was a, uh, just a painting class of do what you want to do. And suddenly I found this whole language of mine and a whole other world had opened up and it was just a natural thing for me to, to fall into. And at the time I was married and both my husband and I were applying to graduate, in his case postgraduate schools, and we both applied to Stanford and UCLA. And at Stanford I applied for a PhD in art education and UCLA applied to the Pictorial Arts Program, MFA, and he applied to what, what he was applying to. And I got into both, but he only got into UCLA. So by that quirk, okay, we came to UCLA, and I went into the MFA program. And I started showing at the County Museum in my second year. And it was just an accident. I had no idea. And it wasn't until people began writing about my work, which was pretty soon, that I began to think, well, maybe I am an artist. But it was not something that I had dreamed of, or practiced, or thought of, it was just an accident. My own art always had to do with whatever is happening in my life, and it's very autobiographical. And it deals with whatever I'm thinking, feeling, seeing, doing, the trips I've gone on, the experiences I've had, the dreams I've had. Um, it is about the self-generation of imagery that comes from my own experience. So, I have some questions about feminism and your experience as a woman artist. 
did you face any particular challenges being a woman? For, I, you know, most fortunately I didn't. I got into graduate school, well I think one of the things that helped me is that my name is not this or that. And my name as I grew up was so unique that, and to this day still, I get letters uh, from Mr. Gila Hirsch, and I, when I send resumes to different countries, and I met at the train or the plane, and here are these, you know, venerable people looking for a man. And so it may have helped me that I wasn't easily identifiable as a, as a woman. So everything went in terms of my work. But in, in actual uh, reality, it did not. I did not face any discrimination personally. But I definitely understood, came to understand the difference between feminist and fe feminine very clearly in 1970. And I became one of the founding mothers of the Los Angeles Council of Women Artists. I'm not a religious person. I never have been. But I am a spiritual person. And the difference is that religion is, has to do with organized dogma and certain things that are observed at certain times and in certain rituals and certain formats. And, all of this is very organized with a very clear uh, structure to it. Uh, to be a spiritual person has no boundaries and has no limits and crosses all kinds of uh, ethnicities, religions, um, material, non-material planes. It is a sense, what I understand is to be, to be a spiritual person is to understand that all things are connected at all levels at all times. And that's it. So I am one of those. <laughs> And uh, the reason that I have such strong uh, Hebrew Judaic identification is that it is my lineage. And I think had I been born a Catholic, I would have that kind of imagery. This is a, a series called the Diamond Series. And the Diamond Series started after I was literally lethally uh, injured in a car accident in 99. And these are very large, they're seven feet tall. And it was at this time that these um, white balls appeared. And I began to understand that these white balls had to do with the presence of calcium. And also, um, I could see them as, uh, in Tibetan Buddhist practice, there's a compassion practice. And the compassion practice has, has the visualizes compassion as a white orb. So I began to see that these, the compassion and the calcium were interrelated, and that's why they appear in all of these paintings, and also in subsequent paintings. So there are also worlds within worlds. And, and in this one, um, this is a very clear example, reconstructing the body after this terrible um, crash. And I had broken all my ribs and five back vertebrae and my sternum and scapula in two places and, and crushed heart, crushed head, crushed everything, flat line heart. So I had to reconstruct the body. <laughs> but you know, here's a, an image. This is from 1974. And uh, this is a, a print of that. And here are these balls. So, and in this case, these balls were the vowels in the Hebrew letters. So that these balls have um, appeared throughout my work for a lot of many